So I've had a bit of a complex relationship with unmanned aerial vehicles over the years. It doesn't matter how many times drones have humiliated me, disappeared without trace, got me into trouble with the law, and even caused me injury, I just keep going back for more. But about five years ago I decided enough was enough and locked all my drone stuff in the shed, and I haven't heard from it since. However, recently, drones reappeared in my life. And this time they swear they've changed for good. So I've decided to give them one last chance. Will I regret it? Stay tuned to find out. This video is brought to you by the good people at PCBWay, who have been my go-to PCB fabrication service since before they even sponsored me, and who I've used dozens of times in both my private and professional life. They do absolutely fabulous work, and unlike other fab houses, have never let me down once. They also do assembly services for as little as $29 for up to 20 boards, and they'll even source all the components for you. Just send them a bill of materials and they'll do the rest. I recently used them to assemble 50 of my Hidman USB to PS2 adapters, and they did a fantastic job at a ridiculously low price. I didn't even bother asking for a discount, the price was so reasonable. PCBWay also offer very reasonably priced low volume CNC machining, injection moulding and sheet metal fabrication, and they even have a design service so you don't need to be an engineer to have custom parts made. Give them a try, you won't be disappointed. Before we start, I just want to make it clear that this video is in no way a guide or tutorial on how to build or fly a drone. On the contrary, I suck at both building and flying drones, so if you actually want to get into this hobby I'd recommend watching literally any other channel. But I don't know, if you've watched every other video on the internet and for some reason you want to watch someone building a crap drone and flying it poorly, then stay tuned I guess. This is really an experiment to see how good a drone I can build as cheaply as possible out of crap I have lying around. If you do insist on building something like this, you'll probably be able to find someone giving most of these parts away for free, they're so old and crap, so maybe reach out to some local drone hobby groups. Anyway, I think the reason I've had so much trouble with drones in the past is I had no idea what type of drone I wanted to build. Back then, either you built a racing slash freestyle drone running a beta flight flight controller, or you built an autonomous GPS drone using an ArduPilot flight controller. I wasn't really into racing or freestyle, so beta flight wasn't for me, and ArduPilot I always find to be really fiddly and complex to set up. I did once build a weird hybrid 5 inch drone with a ArduPilot 2.6 controller crammed in somehow, but as you can imagine it never really worked well. These days though, another flight controller has apparently gotten really stable. It's called iNav, and it seems right up my street. It's basically beta flight with a bunch of extra features that make it easier to fly, and it seems to work on a massive range of different hardware. So I pulled out my massive tub of drone parts and assembled a big pile of hopefully mostly working junk. I'll let past Andy talk you through it. And those of you who've flown quadcopters for a few years, be prepared to say the words, hey, I remember that piece of crap, several times in the next few minutes. All right, so first things first, we need a frame. This is just some generic 250 millimeter drone. I think they used to call stuff like this, was it ZMR 250 or something like that? I don't know if this is a clone of that or if it's an original, but because I think they're normally carbon fiber and this one's made of fiberglass, but uh, it's covered in double-sided sticky tape everywhere. And also it looks like some hay. So I'm guessing that bit the dust at some point. I have to clean all that up, uh, but that's okay. Motor-wise, I found these. They are actually the only name brand motors I could find, and they're barely a name brand. They're Racer Star. I'm sure they'll do fine. Got four of these to power the motors. We've got this ESC or electronic speed controller, and yeah, these are basically just motor drivers. They've got a load of big chunky MOSFETs on them. For our flight controller, once again, we're at the cost-effective end of the market with this some cheapo generic F4 flight controller board. Again, covered in what looks like grass. I'm guessing this is maybe the receiver wires attached to it. For the receiver, I'm going to use this. I don't know what it is. What is it? FR Sky. It's an X8R. They've got two antennas, which is pretty good for, I think, diversity. So to connect to the receiver, I've got this. It's a classic. It's a Turnigy 9X transmitter. And it has an FR Sky transmitter in it, which is a little bit better than the built-in one in the 9X. It's uh, quite primitive, but you know, hey, what do you need? Just some sticks and some switches. It's not exactly rocket science here. Now, I also want video transmission. Found this. It's a 5.8 gigahertz video transmitter. I'm not sure how good it is or if it even works, but it's the one I've got. So <laughs> for the camera, I'm going to use this, which is a Xiaomi Yi action camera. And these were actually really popular on drones back in the day. Uh, 
a sort of cheap uh, GoPro clone. They weren't too bad actually, I think they had the same sensor as the GoPro Hero 3, but uh, obviously with severely limited firmware ability. But these are good because they actually have composite video output on their micro USB port, so we can hook it directly up to this analog video transmitter and have it transmit without needing a second camera. Now a lot of people say that's a bad idea because the firmware in these cameras does occasionally crash and that locks up the composite video feed as well, so you can't exactly fly at home. But hopefully that'll be dealt with by the next thing on the list, this, which is a GPS antenna. And this allows the drone to operate completely autonomously. Because it's got GPS, you can just put it somewhere in the sky and it'll stay there. Or you can do the most crucial thing, which is return to home. It saves what position it was in when it first took off. And then uh, if you activate return to home, it will fly back to that position, then just safely land. So you can either put it in return to home mode manually, like if you lose video feed, you can do that. Or if it drifts out of range or whatever, then it will automatically go into return to home mode. Uh, I also have this slightly silly camera gimbal. But yeah, it's got a, a servo and it can tilt the camera up and down. That'll keep the camera always pointed at the horizon or always pointed at the ground or whatever I want to be filming. So uh, yeah, if this fits on it, then this will give us a slightly better quality video. I suppose I need to think how I'm going to lay this out. Yeah, obviously the motors will go on each, whatever you call these things, motor arm, I don't know. And then their wires will come presumably to this central point. They connect up to the ESC board, and it presumably wants to go centrally because it has to connect to the most important thing, the flight controller, and it goes on top. Now obviously the camera is going to have to go at the front, so it'll probably be up here like that. So the video transmitter is probably going to want to be up the front as well, so maybe it'll go here video transmission antenna like there. Other thing to worry about would be the receiver for the remote control. So I think the best place for the receiver is going to be here. Now I think the antenna, these receiver antennas are supposed to sort of go at 90 degrees to each other and try to get a bit of distance between them. So I'll maybe have them kind of pointed out words like that maybe? Maybe attach them with a couple of rods or something? The GPS antenna needs to be up, up and away from any uh, interference from the motors especially. Maybe I can mount it up the back and sort of at an elevated height. Again, with some kind of rod, maybe I'll 3D print something. All right, start building. After I'd scraped off all the sticky foam, I put some heat shrink tubing around the propeller arms so I could run the wires for the motor through them and keep everything neat and tidy. I also thread locked the bolts for the motors. I've made that mistake before. Next, I soldered the motor wires and battery to the ESC and attached the flight controller to do some initial motor tests. All right, I'll just try connecting the battery to it and see if it makes the funny bleepy noises. ESC, yep, there we go. We can now make sure that the motors are turning in the correct direction because these two turn anti-clockwise and these two turn clockwise, so we need to make sure that uh, they're actually turning the correct way. Well, they're all turning. This one's turning clockwise, okay, so this one's wrong. This one's wrong. Okay, so everything except motor two is wrong. <laughs> so that's a lot of uh, wires to swap. Luckily, all you have to do to reverse a motor's direction is swap any two of its wires. So getting them turning the correct way didn't take too long. Okay, I think I've got them spinning all the correct way now. Now it's time to install the receiver, which doesn't come with any screw holes. So I used double-sided sticky foam pads to attach it to the frame. The video transmitter does come with screw holes, so I attached some brass standoffs to it and epoxied them to the front of the frame, globbing on even more epoxy to reinforce the joint. The transmitter attaches to this antenna socket, which just screws into the frame lid, and as you can see, the video transmitter works just great. And finally, to hold the GPS and receiver antennas, I 3D printed this funky trident shaped thing. Then I glued the GPS antenna on top and attached the receiver antennas using sticky foam pads and heat shrink tubing. I've also uh, got a couple of these cheapo batteries from Amazon, I don't know what they are. Kuvo. They claim to be 50C, but uh, I doubt that's, prob that's probably not even true. And I've got this slightly too long video transmission antenna, but I'm sure that'll do fine. Uh, the other thing I've added is this. It's a V-Fly Finder 2. Uh, if the drone crashes or whatever, it'll beep really loudly and allow me to find it if I crash it in tall grass or something like that. And there's a lot of tall grass around here, so it's probably a good idea. So yeah, let's, uh, let's take it outside and see if it flies. It was at this point that an unfortunate realisation set in. You see, the UK laws have changed since the last time I messed with drones. It used to be you had to keep 50 metres away from any buildings, but it's now 150 metres, which severely limits my location choices. To be honest, if I'd known that, I would have tried to build a much smaller drone, as they're exempt from the regulations. 
There is a field near my house that's big enough as long as I stay near the river, which I suppose as a side benefit provides somewhere convenient to ditch in if the battery catches fire. So I went out on a sunny afternoon and just sort of flew it back and forward in the field a few times in angle mode just to make sure it wasn't going to fall out the sky. It seemed to be fine, so I took it out over the river, then flipped on return to home mode. It worked perfectly, landing pretty much exactly where it took off. In fact, I had to move to avoid it landing on my head. A couple of days later, I tried again, but this time used GPS hold mode and ascended to the maximum legal height of 400 feet to get a jerky, out-of-focus panorama of the town I live in. Bonus points if you can guess which house is mine, but the GPS held position perfectly, then flew back to me with no hassle whatsoever. So yeah, I guess iNav works great. That evening I was feeling a little cocky, so I decided to head back out and fly up the river a little. The river is about 50 meters wide, so I figured as long as I keep to the middle of it, I shouldn't be flying over anyone's head. And yeah, with a bit of camera stabilization, the footage looks almost acceptable, I suppose. I mean, yeah, it's swarming with rolling shutter artifacts, but for something I built out of junk, it isn't bad at all. 30 years ago, this shot would have cost a fortune. I then made a bit of a mistake. After landing the drone, I forgot to disarm it, and when bending down to pick it up, the throttle got pushed to maximum and the drone took off straight towards my face. I was able to block it with my leg and hand, but the props managed to cut every single finger and a big gash out of my leg, spraying blood all over my clothes and even the transmitter. I wish I could show you the pictures, but I don't think YouTube would like that. It didn't take long to heal, but it just goes to show that copters of this size aren't toys. They're serious pieces of kit, and you really need to be careful around them or you could get seriously hurt. I'm grateful that I got this opportunity to learn before something even worse happened. After that incident, I was a bit scared to fly again, but a few days later I cycled up the river a bit and found another area that had enough clearance from buildings to be able to fly. It was a bit grey that day, so the footage wasn't great, but that's Scotland for you. Then I went even further upriver and was able to get some shots of the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route D Crossing Bridge, catchy title. There was another flyable area on the other side of the bridge, so a couple of days later I nipped over there and had a look around and over the river again. Unfortunately, despite what the weather forecast said, it was actually quite windy that day, so I got blown way off course when flying back in angle mode and I lost sight of it in the sky. It was no problem for the return to home mode though, which took it straight back to me with no hassle whatsoever. So yeah, overall, the drone actually seems to fly really well, in both angle mode and the various GPS modes. Even though I'm very out of practice, never once did I feel like I'd lost control of it or was worried it was going to fly away, etc. So if there's one thing you should take away from this video, apart from don't forget to disarm your drone, it's that iNav is a fantastic piece of software, and for basic autonomous functions like position hold and return to home, it seems to work flawlessly. But has this drone convinced me to get back into the quadcopter hobby? Well, no. As it weighs nearly 700 grams, legally I can't really fly it anywhere, not even in my own garden. I think if you live in the UK, you're really going to want a sub 250 gram drone, as then you can fly it pretty much anywhere you like, as long as you don't take the piss. However, I might be able to repurpose some of these parts onto a 3 inch frame, which if I'm careful might just come in under the 250 gram mark. I would need to buy some new parts though, which kind of goes against the principle of this experiment, but we'll see. Thanks very much for watching, like, subscribe, comment, etc, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye!